So my talk this evening, Wild Plants in the Urban Environment, um, is hopefully what it says on the tin. It's going to be a bit of a gallivant through some of my views and observations of plant life in urban areas. And this is primarily going to be a talk about plants in the London area, because this is where I'm based in central London and where I have been doing a lot of botanizing over the last 30 years or so. Um, first up, a little quiz for you all for the end of the session. Um, can any of you recognize this typical urban landscape? It's from a rather famous film from quite a few decades ago. And this is round the corner from where I used to live in London. Um, but it also exemplifies a typical urban landscape of South East England of Victorian railway sidings, semi light industrial and 20th century housing. This is very much what we think of as a urban landscape for plants and nature in many respects. Now, one of the things I want to talk about as we go through this is actually about how in many ways we've tended both within the conservation sector and also as a wider community of people in this country, overlooked or underplayed or poorly understood the importance and relevance of urban biodiversity, in this case, plants. So this will be an impassioned kind of this is important and this is interesting. It isn't just our fabulous chalk grasslands and our wonderful ancient woodlands. So without further ado, I'm going to actually dive into some of the backbone of and the meat in many respects of, of my talk. So I've been involved in plants and botany for pretty much the whole of my life. Um, the last 30 or so years, as I say, living in central London, I'm originally from the Banbury area. And over the last 20 plus years, I've been involved very specifically with the London Amateur Natural History community, um, most especially through the London Natural History Society and the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. So this map in front of you shows the complexity of being a natural historian in the London area, because quite a few organisations from the botany perspective come into play. So the red line you can see in the middle is the current boundary for modern Greater London as it currently exists. The large circle that wraps around it is what's called the LNHS, the London Natural History Society recording area. And I'll be talking about this a bit later on. So this is our sort of wider reach as a natural history society. Um, so not only do we do urban botany, but we go further afield into the lovely ancient woodlands of Surrey, etc. And then the final sort of areas you can see, which I suspect many of you are familiar with, are the, the vice counties of South East England adjoining London. So I am the vice county recorder for the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland of the county of Middlesex, which is this county just here. So I am responsible for compiling and collating and managing all of the botany records for the Middlesex. And our records for our county go back pretty much as nearly 400 years, some of our records. So there's quite a complex set of organisations and activities in there. And one organisation and type of organisation I also forgot to mention was our local records centre, which is called Giggle. Green Space Information for Greater London, and their remit is within the red line. So there are lots of parties involved in documenting and recording plant life in South East England in the London area. And much of that information I'm going to present today comes from the activities of these organ those organisations and their members. And just delving into this a little bit more, I think for those of you maybe just starting out in your world of botany or understanding the plant life of your area, it is always a really, really good idea to get to understand the history of your plant life. So these are the historic flum floras or some of the historic floras for my county of Middlesex. And these are invaluable literature sources telling me all sorts of very interesting snippets of information about the distribution of plants, 
uh, as early as actually the 16th and 17th century in some cases. So these published literature sources are very, very important pieces of information when it comes to understanding changes in urban plant life and more up to date in some respects. And the core backbone of what we use in the London area at the moment is what's called the, the, the Floor of the London Area, which was published by Rodney Burton in 1983. And you can see by modern standards of sort of book production, this is a relatively simple affair with the square grids. And this is the LNHS polygon that I referred to earlier on this big circle that runs around Greater London. I'm in the midst of working with the London Natural History Society in updating this flora for the whole of the London area. Um, and it's fair to say this is probably going to take me in the round about 20 years to complete. I'm about halfway through at the moment. It is a Herculean task, corralling volunteers, historic data sets and managing all sorts of activities and processes. And at times it's fair to say, honestly, to be honest, it feels somewhat thankless. But one of the things about this document and the earlier documents is it tells us how very, very profoundly my city of London's biodiversity has changed over the last 150, 200 years or so. And these are the processes which are occurring right across the board in our cities and larger towns. And urban biodiversity is so important when it comes to understanding change, particularly as things stand at the moment with climate change. And I'll come back to that a bit later on as well. So I say we've got a long history in South East England and the London area of recording. In fact, actually, this is not quite the earliest, but these are some of the early botany records for the London area. So a gentleman called Thomas Johnson, who rather marvellously sorted out Gerard's Herbal, which was a fairly ropey and badly translated with full of errors production in its first edition form. Um, what you want is the immaculate version produced by Thomas Johnson, which is a much better one. Johnson was a fantastic botanist who actually was one of the first people to document his activity of botanizing. And so he recorded his activities of going and leaving central London, well, it is now central London, but was then just London in 1629, walking through Kentish Town up into Hampstead Heath. And the, uh, the document itself is full of interesting snippets about the behaviour of people, things like, oh, so-and-so turned back when it started to rain or it took ages for everybody to eat their sandwiches and then we, we finally got moving and we got there. But the other thing about this document is not only the, the cultural information, but actually the fact that it tells us something about how much Hampstead Heath has changed. I suspect some of you may have visited Hampstead Heath, but today it is most definitely not a heathland in the way that we ordinarily understand it. The tiny amount of heather that is there now is essentially artificially held in management. Essentially, we've got a woodland and amenity grassland landscape. And this is because of several hundred years of intense urbanisation, land management change, the removal of grazing in the early 20th century, and increasingly pollution from airplanes, nearby cars and dogs. So the Hampstead Heath of today is most certainly nothing like the Hampstead Heath of 300 years ago. And these massive changes have resulted in extinctions, amongst other things. So this plant here on the left is the May lily, um, which is still and um, has always been a nationally very rare plant with very few localities. The Hampstead population, which was the only one in southeast England, died out around 1900 or so. Other plants in the London area, which we sometimes get very confused about their natural distribution in Britain and Ireland, such as this lily of the valley, are rare in the London area. But that is in part because much of London is actually on neutral to acidic soils. And lily of the valley is the type of plant that which prefers overall soils that are calcareous, limestone and, and chalky. So lily of the valley has always been a, a, a relatively rare plant over much of London, apart from in the south, where we have some chalk in modern day Greater London. <laughs> 
So we're seeing uh, nationally scarce and uncommon plants becoming much, much rarer through the processes of urbanisation. Some of this has been because of local depredation, digging up attractive plants such as this, and others because of large scale land management changes. So in many urban areas, we have hints of former landscape um, or in many cases, quite large chunks. So these are two examples of fine veteran trees in two important landscapes in the London area. The beech tree on the left is from Epping Forest and the wonderful veteran oak here on the right is from Richmond Park. These are both landscapes that are hundreds and hundreds of years old, internationally important for their biodiversity. But in many respects, the ground flora in much of this, in these two, both of these still very important and fascinating sites, has been lost through management change activities, as I say, loss of grazing, et cetera, et cetera. And particularly these days, pollution impacts um, from dog walking, et cetera, et cetera. So we have landscape which still exists, but elements of it are being scalloped out as we speak. And so plants such as wood and enemy, um, which is still a nationally common plant, are now becoming very, very scarce in the London area and are gradually passing into history for us. Other species such as this cowweed, which I suspect might be quite common for you in certain areas in Herefordshire, this plant is now vanishingly rare in the London area. This is a semi or hemiparasitic plant um, that feeds off grasses in woodland habitats. And it has a very, very specialised ecology in terms of its parasitism, but also in its association with woodland ants that disperse the seeds around in the woodland environment for it. So if you take one of these things out of the equation for a species like this, its populations crash. And we now have in the London area, literally a couple of patches that are about the size of my double beds just to the left-hand side of me. So we're seeing old landscape and old landscape plants diminishing bit by bit. Um, they do hang on here, there and there in places sometimes which are overlooked. And in so often in urban areas, we tend to see marginal habitats as being you know, unimportant or uninteresting, but they can hold refugia of old environment. One of my favourite ones in the London area, which is now we realise what it is, is being recorded more, and I suspect maybe with you in the Herefordshire, is this wonderful variant of the common, common stinging nettle, Urtica dioica subspecies Galeopsifolia. And this essentially is a stingless form of stinging nettle with much longer, narrower, rather willowy leaves. And it has evolved to grow in fen environments where it is not impacted by too much grazing from cattle, horses, etc., etc. Therefore, it doesn't need a sting. So this is a plant that whenever we find it, albeit overlooked, we know we're in old pieces of relictual landscape in the London area because it's associated with old fen systems. Other plants such as this wonderful silverweed um, are resisting landscape change and environmental change. Um, one of my kind of conundrums as a botanist and, you know, as a conservationist in London area is people often talk about Canada geese very negatively in this country, about how bad they are. Actually, in the London area, on age, areas where we've got large lakeside and habitats and large grasslands by the lakesides, they often serve a really fantastic purpose because as ardent grazers of grass, they keep grass nice and short. That enables short grain plants such as this potent Tilleranzarina or Argentina as it's now called, to thrive in a habitat that would otherwise close over with competition from other species. So you get some conflicting priorities for many people because in most perspectives of landscape management, Canada geese are viewed as unwelcome. Now, the history of our society, our city of London is full of great events such as the Great Fire of London and small events. And I'm going to talk about the small event first because I'm going to come back to the great event a bit later on in a moment, is that one of the things about urban areas is you can tell so much about the people and the populations that live in there through their plant life. So this wonderful plant, um, Loquat here on the right hand side, is 
gradually becoming naturalized in parts of London where we have Greek and Turkish populations in particular, because this is a fruit which is very popular with those communities. They're often nibbled along the street and people throw the fruit out. They go onto it over the edge of a railway site, wasteland nearby, and these plants are now starting in a few places in parts of central London. So you can build up a sort of cultural understanding of your city and your through the plants that are around you. Now I'm going to stick for a moment with the Great Fire of London. So this plant here is London Rocket. Um, and this is one of the most iconic plants in the London area because it gained its name because after the Great Fire of London, the burn sites across London went bright yellow with sheets of this plant for the next decade or so before the city rebuilt. And it was given the name London Rocket. Now, this plant um, is essentially a Mediterranean species. It's a plant of warm climates. And London was obviously in the middle of the Little Ice Age, on the tail end of the Little European Ice Age, and Southern England was overall relatively cold. This species then, bit by bit, gradually petered out and became more or less extinct in the London area. Over the last 30 years or so, this is one of quite a wide range of Mediterranean species that's become much, much more common in southern England as our climate warms and it is gradually re-establishing, sometimes from sources that we don't fully understand, maybe from garden throughouts and other things like that as a horticultural contaminant, which I'll touch on momentarily a bit later on or possibly from tiny relictual populations that have been surviving in warm corners for the last couple of centuries or so. So plants such as this are in many ways really valuable tools for helping us understand how the environment is changing. And this is another sort of suite of urban non-natives which are becoming locally frequent in parts of our city. All three of these plants are essentially Mediterranean in origin, they broadly represent a group of plants that we refer to as wintergreen annuals. So they're adapted to the Mediterranean environment where seed germinates in the autumn rains and grows slowly through the winter. And as the spring warms up, they flower and fruit rather rapidly before the summer heat burns everything off. So they're adapted to a Mediterranean environment at that nice cool environment bit in the middle. These are all species which neither occurred or were very, very rare over large chunks of southern England. Um, and over the last 10, 20 years, each one of these has become more frequent and establishing. So this lovely stinging nettle here, Urtica membranacea, was first recorded in Britain, in Warwick actually, of all places in 2004, I think. We found it about a year later in central London, and we now have about 15 locations where it's established. It's rather unusual in that, like the other Galeopsifolia, this too is a stingless nettle. The plant in the middle, the cudweed, <coughs> excuse me, got a dry throat, um, is a species which has been established in our environment for hundreds, if not thousands of years but historically used to be really, really rare, particularly through the 20th century with changes in our environment and landscape management, et cetera, et cetera. This is a species again, which is reoccurring and spreading more widely. And the delightful fumitory on the side, this is actually also found as a wild plant in Britain, but this is a non-native form, which we're seeing increasingly frequently in Southern England and the London area in particular. So we're seeing some quite major changes in our urban landscape, um, both in terms of the species composition and also in actually losing that traditional urban open space that we now refer to as brownfield sites. So after the Second World War, London had quite extensive areas of damaged buildings, which were wonderful habitats for such plants as common mallow, Artemisia down here and Hirschfeldia incana, which is our commonest yellow member of the cabbage family in the London area. None of these species are actually native. They're all actually either relatively recent introductions in the case of Hirschfeldia or ancient introductions in the Neolithic period in the case of these other two species. But they are all incredibly important parts of our urban biodiversity. 
sadly they're becoming less common as inner London gets smarter and smarter and more expensive. Well, I was just talking about this, I should have done this the other way around. Um, so this is an exemplar of, you know, London after the Blitz in the 1950s, and the LNHS carried out a series of surveys looking at the impact of the Blitz upon London's plant life and communities. And certainly the Blitz gave opportunities for such things as Rose Bay Willow Herb and Budlia to become very, very firmly established and abundant throughout the London area. Now, this plant here, Asplenium, is one of a suite of several British species of Asplenium of the maidenhair ferns, um, maidenhair spleenworts, or spleenworts, apologies. Um, and it is a species which, up until 40 years ago, was very rare in, in London. This belongs to a group of plants which essentially pollution intolerant so the victorian era did it very badly essentially became extinct in the urbanized part of central London. so much so that when you look at rodney burn from the 1980s here on the right hand side this black and white you can see that central london the dot there are no no members of this species have been recorded here we now move to the current day over here on the other hand side and you can control london has been most exuberantly colonized this species and it is now it's not common but it is reasonably widespread in parts of the city being extinct for a very very long time and this is principally because of the removal of sulfur and to a certain extent circulars from atmospheric pollution. So this is an issue which has done relatively well of late. But we're also seeing again, almost certainly because of climate change, other spleenworts moving into southern England from areas where previously they would not have been found. So we have sea spleenwort here on the left hand side and lanceolate spleenwort on the right. These are two species which are essentially coastal southwest Britain species. Both of them are deeply intolerant to frost and are quite specific in their habitat requirements. And even in Cornwall, more than about 50 metres from the coast, you won't find either of these species growing. Both of these have now turned up in central London. Um, there's spleenworters, the sea spleenwort has been found a couple of times. And we've had two records of the lanceolate one, both in central London locations, which are very warm. They've not been originated, they've not originated from garden estate escapes because neither of these species are grown in horticulture, really. In fact, the sea spleen word is extremely difficult to grow successfully. Um, so these are almost certainly long distance dispersers from southwest Britain. So we're seeing some quite rapid responses to our engagement environmental plants, such as ferns or small grasses, such as this. So this is one of the most successful shifts in a distribution of a plant that we've considered to be um, native in Britain and Ireland. Um, and it's this pale, sickly looking thing up here at the top. This is early meadow grass, power in firma, and beneath it is its close relative in fact actually is derived from it from hybridization of power annua the annual meadow grass one of the most successful plant species globally that has evolved originally in southern europe but has followed our footsteps all across the globe now power infirma the sickly yellow parent used to be viewed as a very rare native species of the lizard peninsula in cornwall and the isles of Scilly where it was a rare but rather somewhat unproposing plant the botanists would go and pay homage to along with the other rarities of the region. In the 80s and early 90s gradually it started to spread from that area of Cornwall and Scilly along the south coast of Cornwall into places in Dorset and Devon, remained firmly coastal still. Then around the early 2000s it started turning up in completely different places first in Hampshire on the coast in Hampshire and then in 2004 very unexpectedly in the London area both myself and a London botanist called David Bevan both found it for the first time in London within two or three days of each other in central London. So this native British species has shifted its range enormously 
And this is to show you the kind of time series. Again, apologize, this is very London centric, but the stories are relevant to you. In fact, this plant has actually been found in most urban locations, um, albeit uncommonly in some areas, certainly in the, the lower half of England. So I suspect it is probably with you somewhere in Herefordshire by now. Um, so this is the records up to, you know, I think 2005. And then as we move the time series forward, you can see it's primarily still in the warm urban areas and the coastal areas, but it's really beginning to establish and spread its distribution quite well. So we've now got quite an abundant new colonist that was formerly restricted to Southwest England. This is an exemplifies how much our environment is changing at the moment. Um, and just to kind of return to, you know, other British plants that I would rather stick with um, the theme of British plants, which are doing very well at the moment. This is ivy broom rape. This is another plant which 40 odd years ago was essentially considered to be a nationally scarce plant, restricted to coastal habitats and growing on ivy because this is a parasite of ivy. It has become locally frequent in parts of central London over the last 20 years and fairly often turns up in roadside verges and in car parks, etc, etc. It's not a particularly fussy plant. It is possibly being moved around in the London area through horticulture. Ivy is quite often used as a bedding plant or as, or as a ground cover plant rather, and it is possible that this plant is moving around with its host through horticulture. We still don't quite know how it's getting around in the London area. Nevertheless, it's doing rather well. Other Southeast England are doing dreadfully here or were up until very recently. So here we have a very strong contrast. So this is Saxifraga tridactylites, a beautiful little saxifrage, and we have meadow saxifrage on the right hand side. This is an annual, this is a, essentially a short lived perennial. Now, both species um, were crashing in their populations over the last 100 years across the London area. And meadow saxifrage is now one of our rarest wild plants in London area. We've got about three populations, each of which have probably got 20 or 30 plants in. It's doing very, very badly. Similar story was being told by saxifraga tridactylites. We were actually down at one point to probably about 20 plants in the whole of, I'll do that again, 20 plants in the whole of Greater London. Uh, and there were about three locations where it survived just. And then about 15 years ago, people started noticing it turning up on railway track beds and on road verges and on cracks in pavements on the edges of housing estates. And we are now founding it in some locations in inner London by the million. So certainly the approaches on the railway tracks to Victoria in the spring go white with this plant for short periods of time. The extraordinary shift in its abundance of success we don't really understand, but I have a suspicion, I don't have the money to test this thing, but this may be, along with some other urban plants, developing resistance to weed killer. So it's evolved a resistance to weed killer through chance interaction with the application, and has then been able to utilise that habitat on rail, on roadsides, railway track beds, etc, etc, as a new habitat for it. So this species has gone from being exceptionally rare in London to now locally very, very common indeed. So we're seeing um, native plants having variable fates in our city and Non-native plants, often mainstays of gardening, um, becoming actually increasingly important in our urban biodiversity. And 20, 30 years ago, we would have not expected to be seeing such plants as cabbage palm or passion flower growing as wild, self-regenerating natural populations in the London area. But we are on the brink of that. Um, passion flower, the fruit, uh, are dispersed by birds, and we occasionally find this plant growing on roadsides and the odd piece of brownfield sites as well. 
Much more frequently and rather more successful is cabbage palm cordelini, where we regularly find seedlings now. Most of them don't persist because they get, they get sprayed with weed killer, but we are starting to see this plant establish on the River Thames because one of the ways it gets around is that it is often grown in some of the larger posher gardens of West London and probably Oxfordshire and further afield. And when the flower spikes um, have finished and the fruit set of fruit, the gardeners either purposefully or accidentally let the flower spikes fall into the River Thames and they raft down through London. And you often find bundles of them lying on the strand line in parts of urban central London and then lots of little seedlings of this nearby. So this is a species originally from New Zealand, one of their most important wild plants, which is on the brink of establishing as a wild plant in this country. Other plants which have been with us for a long time as safe, respectable horticultural plants are beginning to show their teeth with climate change. So this wonderful and glorious plant tree of heaven, Ilanthus altissima, um, has been in Britain's gardens since about 1760. It's a beautiful and fine plant, hence its traditional name. Um, and for most of the 240 odd, 50 odd years, it has been a rather well behaved, sedate street tree that never or virtually never reproduced. Again, as the climate has shifted, this is a species primarily from southern China, as our climate has warmed up, the abundant production of seed has increased and we are seeing seedlings such as this. So this species is now establishing quite enthusiastically on roadsides, canal margins, and particularly on railway tracks across Southeast England and the London area. It will be coming to you very soon if you haven't got it already. Um, and again, this is to show the shift. These dots here from the 1980s are essentially showing the odd seedling. So it was scattered and rare and uncommon. It is now widespread through the core urban area of Greater London. It is increasingly being seen as a severe risk for urban habitats and almost ultimately in the long term our wider landscape. It is known to be one of the most serious invasive species across Europe, so in parts of southern and central France and the Mediterranean region. This causes severe ecological damage and also has um, damaging impacts upon infrastructure and human health and well-being because it can cause really nasty blistering if you when you're cutting it down. So this is one of the really worrying signs of how our environment is changing. Um, one area that is really suffering some very mixed fortunes in the London area is water quality. Very topical at the moment nationally. Um, and whilst broadly speaking, London's canals are not too bad in terms of their chemistry, they might be somewhat eutrophied. Many of them are now deeply, deeply turbid because of the increase in recreational traffic. So many of London's aquatic plants, particularly pond weeds, have declined significantly in the last 20 years. Some of them, such as another plant, such as this Boldelia, we now have only one population of Boldelia across the whole of Greater London. But then you find some gems. This rather formal and grand lake is in the Barbican Centre in central London. And it's actually supplied by a, um, from underground, I can't remember the word all of a sudden, it's got its own borehole. And the water quality is very, very good. And it actually supports a really, really fantastic diversity of submerged aquatic plants. So the most nature unfriendly in one level perception can actually turn out to be really a rather fantastic location. So we're seeing quite major changes in distribution of plants and their occurrence. One of the notable ones in the London area was this, the discovery of a lizard orchid in London. This plant here, one of Britain's, well, up until relatively recent, one of our rarest species, was actually first record in London in 300 years. Here it is in its tiny, tiny fenced off reserve, um, and it's still there. It's been with us for about 15 years. Sadly, it's not reproducing. So 
we're seeing some changes in terms of the distribution of plant species. We're also seeing, and I'm sure you're affected by this, an enthusiasm for using um, annual arable plants such as corn cockle, etc., etc., to create so-called wildflower seed mixes. I shall resist saying anything negative about this at this point and we'll hold on to that for discussions later on. But wildflower seed mixes are something we need to be very careful about as a community. I referenced how orchids are responding very successfully in the form of a lizard orchid. I should have probably put these slides the other way around. We are seeing quite significant expansion in some of the populations of some orchid species in the London area, particularly pyramidal and bee orchid are doing very well. And interestingly, green winged orchid, which was essentially extinct in London up until 10 years ago, has now turned up on three green roofs. So it is finding a new location in which to live on cities in well-constructed green roofs in our city. Other plants, actually I'm going to, apologies, I'm going to skip that because I can see that I'm going over, so I'm going to move past that, apologies. I want to talk about momentarily about acid grasslands because some of London's most important habitats are not chalk grasslands. We have some very good ones in the far south, but acid grassland is one of our most important habitats. Um, we are having major problems um, with these being planted with trees, amongst other things. Um, the panic stricken reaction to uh, the climate change emergency is getting people leaping for tree planting. We need to be very strong in defending our grassland habitats, whether it be acid grassland or other forms of grassland, because they are some of our most endangered habitats. Our chalk grasslands in the London area are probably doing a little bit better. Um, they're less extensive, but they tend to be more valued by our community and therefore there's a little bit more focused activity in protecting them. Nevertheless, they're tiny fragments of what we once had, but they do support important small populations of such things as clustered bellflower and crosswort. Now crosswort is still nationally frequent, I put in inverted commas, but this is considered at risk of extinction across England because of the, the extent to which its population has declined over the last 30 years. Similarly, on the River Thames, we are seeing things such as strawberry clover on the brink of extinction. Again, this is a species which, if you look at botany books, is described as being locally common or frequent. We have about two or three surviving populations of strawberry clover in London. It's now an extremely rare plant. Its close relative, the woolly clover, Trimentotomentosum, is a delightful little annual species which grows in southeast London in only one site. And it's the only site in Britain and Ireland for this species that I know of. Another impact of our activities and our changing environment is actually the River Thames is actually getting saltier because as the North Sea rises and southern England sinks, the salinity of the North Sea is pushing inwards into the River Thames and we're finding some of our um, Thames habitats are gradually becoming more saline and species such as Aster tripolium are moving into urban Greater London. I'm going to move past this with apologies. I might come back to that later, but I wanted to talk momentarily about quite often I get asked from people, what should we do in the nature? What should we do in the urban environment? And um, what's good for nature? And people often want to plant buddleia or something like this. These are probably my three favourite go to insect friendly plants for the urban gardener. Any form of knapweed fleabane, Pulicaria dysenterica, and the absolutely fabulous and really wonderful Eupatorium acanabinum hemp agrimony. These are three outstanding British wild plants of great beauty and really, really fantastic for invertebrates. There are, of course, many others. Now, I'm just going to round off slightly because then we can have a little discussion with showing you the real extent of how things are changing at the moment. As human beings are really bad at noticing change as a, as a population, but these two maps show the extent to which 
partly through humans moving plants around the landscape, but most definitely also because of climate change, how much plant distributions and urban areas plant distributions are changing. So this is the distribution of round leaf crane spill. It's a small annual crane spill, sometimes biennial, but it's one of the smaller, smaller geraniums. This is its historic, somewhat patchy and very uncommon distribution across most of England prior to 1950. And you can see straight away from the map on the right, its current distribution, how much this species has spread but also within that distribution, how common it is becoming in some areas. So 30 years ago, when I started botanizing in the London area, finding round leaf geranium would have been a little moment of joy and a little bit like, oh, that's exciting. It has now become really pretty common in large chunks of Greater London. So the, the enthusiasm is somewhat diminished on the rarity front. It is nevertheless still a rather nice plant to find. And this last example, shows probably one of the most stark rain shifts that are occurring at the moment. So this is waterbent polypogon viridae. It's a rather nondescript grass until you get your eye in and you're used to it. Once you understand it, it's actually a very, very easy species to identify. And again, you can see the distribution of this plant is very sparse and scattered before 1950, essentially associated with Dockland areas and, and urban areas across various parts of Britain. Now, this is a species which, like some of the other annuals I mentioned earlier on, is a Mediterranean. It's a wintergreen growing plant. It thrives in a Mediterranean climate. That is, in essence, what large chunks of southern England are becoming or on the brink of becoming. And the impact of the shifting climate over the last 50 years, or 70 years rather, is so profound you can see the massive change in distribution as we have today. So this is a shift in distribution which has been started by human transport of plant materials around our islands, but it is being mediated and made more powerful by the shift in our climate. And pretty much the last to say, you know, this talk would not be possible without the amateur natural history community. Um, both the London Natural History community, in my sense, but the further afield. And we should all, particularly in these challenging times globally, give each other a little hug every now and then because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, and last, I think it's last, yes. If any of you remember the slide at the beginning, that fair railway arch, it was the rail lady killers. Thank you. So. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody has questions, but I have one, which is um, you, when you talk about, um, like you, all these plants are spotted somehow. And I, I don't, I presume you aren't walking around London <laughs> spotting plants. And, but you also talked about the, the project at the end. So mm. how is it that you, how do these plants it discovered the ones that you find that are rare how are you how are you um auditing discovering um i think this is one of the um tragedies of how we've got some dysfunction in our natural history conservation community at the moment and generally speaking i've noticed nationally that wildlife trusts are not very well connected with the amateur recording organizations such as the botanists so in the case of the london area we have the london natural history society and the london parts of the botanical society of britain and ireland and um, we have a complicated a quite sophisticated network of people who do literally what you say go out and record plants and it's done in a couple of different ways one of which is if we've got a, say, a, a particularly nice honeypot site that we want to see, like a nice piece of chalk grassland or a lovely ancient wood, we'll have a, a day out where we'll get like particularly beginners who give training activities and, and help them learn how to identify plants. And we make species lists and look for species conservation concern. And those get noted. 
The other approach is what we refer to as square bashing, which is where particularly um, enthusiastic and committed volunteers within these organisations literally choose a particular grid square, it might be a 10 kilometre grid square or one kilometre grid square, and they count and observe every single plant species they can find. So we have a, a reasonably, I mean, we sometimes have problems with capacity, but we have quite a um, a developed network of people doing all sorts of those kind of activities across the London area and further afield across the UK and Ireland. So as a measure of the quantity of data, I for Middlesex in the greater London area, I probably sit on several million botany records collected across greater London over the last 400 years. So, and um, there will be across, and there is, across the rest of the country, vice county recorders or other people like me sitting on similar bodies of information about plants, about birds, about beetles, about fungi. Um, so there is a very, very large network of amateur natural historians with information that should be the primary source of knowledge for, or at least a rather, apologies, a primary source of knowledge for any activities or decisions around landscape management. Unfortunately, we rarely are. And do you also, I mean, do you record fungi as well as? as so the, the BSBI and the London, so the BSBI is essentially vascular plants. So BSBI mm -hmm. primarily does ferns, conifers and flowering plants. Um, and some some do um, um, stone words. So there's a separate community, which is the British Mycological Society and a couple of other associated bodies which do field recording of fungi. Again, there are literally several million records nationally of fungi in these national databases. And most of that data gets fed in through these different organisations into the National Biodiversity Network, the NBN. Now, the NBN is often used by ecologists, professional ecologists or, develop, or ecologists working for developers for doing desk exercises on what they say or think might be in a place. But the NBN data, depending on the group, doesn't always have all of the information. Um, and it doesn't always have, it doesn't have the granular knowledge and the detailed background information. You know, that's where local knowledge and regional knowledge comes into play. You know, I've been doing my role in London now for about 15 years, but I inherited it from Rodney Burton, who'd been doing it for 30 odd years. He inherited it from a man called Dougie Kent, who would also be around that. So there's this continuity of information and knowledge, which is part of that body uh, within the amateur natural history community, which is very rarely utilised in this country um, for positive wildlife management through things like wildlife trusts or for actually dealing with some of the greater challenges around development pressures and such like that. So, yeah, we've, we're sitting on a gold mine, but it's not used a lot in certain areas. And in your, in your talk, you uh, mentioned um, the whole question of meadows. And yeah. yes, yeah, so could you um, uh, elaborate your, your comments as you suggested that <sighs> you have more to say about this? So annual seed mixes of bright multiple colours of red, white and blue and the odd bit of pink and orange and yellow are not meadows. Now, they are a popular engagement tool in certain circumstances for connecting people with the value of the natural world. They should not be seen as a response to the biodiversity crisis or climate crisis because there's plenty of scientific evidence that shows, despite to the contrary of some of the pundits pushing this, 
that um, the biodiversity value is relatively limited. It's better than concrete, but it is relatively limited compared to a species rich grassland or other such things, or even a relatively species sport. Now, one of the problems is that we tend to make value judgments on what's good for nature based on our own aesthetics. And that is a pretty poor way of making a decision about what is good for wildlife. One of the things I always say to any organization thinking about doing one of these seed mixes is, and, they, and they, like I say, they can be useful in the right space. Have you done a survey of the landscape beforehand? And nearly always they go, no, or, oh, we had a look at it and it was really boring. And it's like, are you a trained botanist? Are you an entomologist? Do you know what's there? Generally, they don't. So certainly, for example, in London, where a lot of the sites which have been our, our short grass, lawn mown grass in London area, often supports some of our most vulnerable and rare grassland species, such as strawberry clover. So and actually the example of the lizard orchid, that lizard orchid was found growing on a really, really boring piece of roadside verge behind a bus shelter with crisp packets and dog poo all over the place. If you'd use that aesthetic thing of going, oh, well, I looked at this and I thought it was really boring, you could have turned that into a wildflower seed mix and killed one of Britain's rarest orchids. So it always, always get a survey done. You know, that should be the basis for any form of landscape management change. You know, if you don't know what is there in the first place, you are being foolhardy. It really is that blunt. The other thing, and increasingly, because it's really hard getting this complicated messaging across, is um, actually the more blunt thing for people to realise is that actually these annual seed mixes are from a carbon sequestration climate change perspective are actually pretty bad maths. So first thing about them is in many cases, they depend upon imported seed, which has come from Southeast Europe or further afield around the globe. They're very rarely produced locally. So then it's all imported with associated risks around things like that. And also the carbon miles of importing these things. They are also um, often require cultivation and or spraying with weed killer to kill the pre-existing vegetation where you might kill things like a strawberry clover or lizard orchid. Not good for biodiversity. You know, we should not be spraying weed killer around unless we absolutely have to. And the other thing about these plants ultimately is you then, if you sow them to maintain that type of landscape, you need to do this annually. These need annual or biannual cultivation. That requires rotivators, mowers, et cetera, et cetera. And all, so the associated machinery and management with it. So there's quite a big carbon debt in that. The other thing which is really, really worrying about these plants in, this, in these circumstances is that grasslands are actually increasingly recognised. You know, people like me have been saying for 30, 40, 50, 100 years, but it's beginning to say into what grasslands are incredibly important carbon sinks in a different way to woodlands and in a different way to peatlands but they are really really important carbon sinks particularly old grasslands that has not been cultivated or mowed but even boring grass that's been there for years is because most of the carbon sequestration in grassland is not in what you can see above ground it's underground in the roots and in the associated microbial diversity around grass and perennial plant roots in grasslands. Annual seed mixes, the root systems are tiny relative to grasslands. So you're really potentially negatively affecting the carbon budget quite severely by doing these pretty knee jerk reactions and thinking you're, you're solving a problem when you're not in many cases. So I'm not impressed as you can tell. I, ha I just have another question which is about um because like but there's some <clears throat> places in Hereford in the city which we are um really would like 
to not have developed, but also mm. to, uh, you know, increase the biodiversity. And I think you're working on a project um, in London where um, you have been fighting the council in terms of what, what a piece of land um, uh, has to offer. And um, can you just talk about that a little bit? Because I think there might be parallels with what well, we're trying to do. I must admit, yeah. I've not been doing the fighting. I've no. been doing the supporting. OK. Um, so again, comes down to the primary thing I've mentioned. My core message is you need to do surveys of sites before you make decisions about what they do. So I've been supporting a really fantastic grassroots campaign called Save Warren Farm in the London Borough of Ealing, which has got a very small and devoted group of people who have fought incredibly efficiently, but at great personal cost and hard work to prevent a piece of open grassland habitat that's quite species rich with things such as ladies bed straw and other acid grassland plants in it, some of which are nationally rare and at risk of extinction from being turned into a private facility for a private football club and company and club and, and sprayed and destroyed. Part of the effectiveness of their campaign has been, you know, in the politics of communicating with people, in the power of using social media, but a really large part of it is by them collecting really robust primary evidence about what is actually on that site. Because the council and the people intending to go ahead with the developer development had commissioned for ecologists and the ecological survey was perfunctory and dismissed the site and was full of factual errors. And we were able to demolish those factual errors um, and actually show that what they were saying was incorrect and only a tiny fragment of the truth for these sites. So the first thing is always going to be really understand your location because, you know, if you get caught out in your communication and you say something with a bit of hyperbole in it or that's inaccurate about, you know, the biodiversity of that place and you get caught out, you, you, you've wrecked yourself. So understanding your landscape is really important. Understanding what you think is achievable for it as well. And again, that comes back to, you know, responses, you know, we need to keep grasslands as grasslands. We've lost conservatively 97% of our grasslands in Britain, of our species rich grassland. That's being conservative. It's probably considerably higher for some type grassland types. So that level of loss is vast compared to woodland and scrub, both of which are also important habitats. So anytime people start talking about planting trees on grassland, you need to really give them a bit of a Paddington bear stare and get them to think it through. Um, again, planting trees in much of lowland Britain is not necessary for conservation reasons. Most sites have got parent trees nearby and natural regeneration is, should be the way forward in many sites. So that would that would be my personal view is really about getting that part of your armory together, knowing what's on your site. And that you can only do really through partnering up with your local amateur natural history group, your local biological record centre is usually have usually got good connections with them um, because it's, to be honest, you know, wildlife trusts are a wonderful national framework. I used to be a trustee of the London Wildlife Trust. I used to work for the London Wildlife Trust and I'm working with a couple of trusts at the moment on projects. But the pressures they have in terms of managing sites, engaging with their members mean that they are sometimes shorthanded when it comes to knowledge around um, certain aspects of biodiversity. It's just the simple metrics that they have to exist in. I'm not saying that's across the board, but there is a tendency for them sometimes for them to be underskilled in terms of knowledge. And many of them are actually quite bad at keeping records of what they have on their sites for those reasons. I, I still have another question, which is you were talking about various plants in um, 
or in urban London, which are ones that have are non-native, for example. Yes. And so they've been able to thrive because of climate change. Um, can you just talk about also because your some of your work is around invasive species? Yes. So I just wondered about the tension between those those which seem like good um, plants and the invasive ones that. Okay. Some of us are very familiar with, yeah. not that many. Actually. So I think you know, this is a really important sort of public communication message, probably less so with this community. But the first thing, of course, is essentially is to uncouple non-native from invasive. So London's flora is full of a huge amount of native plants as well as non-native plants. And 90% of London's non-natives are not invasive whereas a small minority are. In fact, we do have some native species which, because of pollution, et cetera, et cetera, are now invasive. So it's really important to uncouple those terms. They come back together in the concept of non-native invasive species, such as, as Tree of Heaven, but they're not bolted and permanently linked. There are such things as actually, for example, Hirschfeldia, the yellow cabbagey thing, is a non-native species, it's a European plant, has been with us as a white, an important plant in London for about 50, 60 years, but has been with us for well over 150 or so, maybe longer. It's actually a really important part of London's ecosystems because it is really, really good for a really wide range of invertebrates. Um, as a member of the cabbage family, it's, it's very, very important to lots of invertebrates. So it's really important to separate those things so the work I currently do at the moment on invasive species is helping to keep our pretty much now dead London Act local action group on invasive species functioning. So there are local action groups or catchment level action groups for doing practical work on managing invasive species across the countryside. The Norfolk one's particularly active and useful. Um, and that will be providing information to ecologists, land managers and developers around what invasive species are in a particular area. So I compile the lists for the London area and for the botany and update them when I've got time, um, as well as working and attempting to coordinate actual on the ground management and response. So that's one of the things I do, although sadly at the moment we're just really struggling with resourcing in the London area and that our local group is on the brink of folding because of lack of finance. The other things I do are essentially on a sort of national level. I provide advice to the UK biodiversity, sorry, the biodiversity, to the UK biocontrol programme. So this is the programme that looks for um, organisms to manage and control in non-native invasive species such as Japanese knotweed or Himalayan balsam. So that's introducing organisms to reduce, manage their population. And I advise on some parts of that work. And the other thing I do is working with an organisation called the GB Non-Native Species Secretariat where I do, um, I'll come back to that in a second, Jimmy, um, where I give advice on what we call horizon scanning and risk assessing for potential new invasive species coming into the countryside. So looking at things like global trade, what things are likely to affect um, our biodiversity, what things are likely to establish under climate change. So that's kind of some of the stuff I do around invasive species. Now, as somebody said, Ah, OK. Right. How do you know whether a plant has been introduced by human or natural means? <laughs> or does it matter? Nah, there's quite a few layers. So start off with the how do we know whether something is native or non-native? Again, remember, non-native is a neutral term like native. It has not got a, a value attached to it of good or bad in the way that invasive does. Na non-native is simply a statement of fact and the statement of fact essentially is a native species we record things as native through things like uh, in the case of plants um, pollen records so pollen data going in our soils can give us a strong indication of how long populations of plants have been established in 
our environment and when they got there. So we use things like pollen, subfossil records of foliage, landscape knowledge. So if you know, if you've got an ancient landscape like the Lizard Peninsula with ancient heathland in it, the plants on the Lizard Peninsula are largely kind of essentially recognised to be non-native. So some of it is landscape history, various forms of empirical, but you can also use genetic studies by looking at genetics to build up an understanding of the population biology of organisms to confirm whether things are naturally evolved or dispersed into the area. So we can actually, with pretty high level of confidence in many cases, actually decide whether something is native or not. We do argue about some of them. Um, does it matter? Like I say, being non-native is not per se bad. It's when something is invasive that is bad. Now, invasive itself is generally in the world of science is qualified as this. It's not about something merely being somewhere. Invasiveness is about an organism causing significant damage or destruction to a habitat or ecosystem or causing the extinction of other organisms. So there's quite a high bar before we start saying an organism is invasive. It doesn't have to be, and we don't use invasive in the same way that gardeners do. You know, so grumbling about strawberries rampaging all over your garden is not the same as invasiveness in the biological habitat management sense. So they're, they're, we, we use the language slightly differently. Does it matter? I would argue it does. Um, as I say, most non-natives are not harmful. That does not mean we should be blithely introducing things all over our landscape um, without uh, any care in the world. I think it's very interesting that there's a bit of a dissonance in our society. And I came a bit of a bit of a bit of blows with uh, Chris Packman, Packham over this a while back. If it would generally be considered unacceptable to be going around releasing exotic mammals, birds, butterflies, etc., etc., into our landscape without a good reason. We as a society still think it's acceptable to go out planting non-native species of plants all over our landscape, throwing wildflower seed mixes all over our landscape. The values around that speak volumes about the values that we have as a society about what plants are and their importance. Society is terribly plant blind and it's to our detriment. So, yes, non-natives are an important part of our landscape and history. We should not necessarily be therefore going, well, that's great. Let's just put loads more out there, particularly at a time of massive environmental change. The first thing should be think, consider, look at your options before you start doing daft things that you're going to regret later on. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Because we don't seem to have another one in our chat. Oh, we have a new one. <laughs> Cochlearia, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hello. So urbanised urban areas make some specialised microhabitats, such as rather huge roadside. Um, what other uncles do you use examples like this? So actually, cochlearia is a really good. So, cochlearia danica is a native coastal plant of coastal cliffs and rocks primarily, um, but also salt marshes. And this is a species which, over the last 50 years, has moved inland on trunk roads because of road salting. So, we have created a non native habitat, so to speak, for a native species. Um, I think it's fair to say that this is probably in the long term, in this particular case, is not sustainable because one of the things we know about road salting and also road use in as a whole is all of that road salt and all the other things like rubber particulates coming off the road, um, petrol pollutants, et cetera, et cetera. That is all washing away into our, into our ro off our roads, into our aquatic habitats and into adjoining landscape. So, yes, seeing road salted microhabitats is on one level fascinating but it speaks volumes about the level to which we blithely pollute our environment um yeah there are um quite a few curious urban or post-industrial microhabitats 
lead rich or more heavy metal pollutant rich soils are an interesting sort of sub habitats for certain parts of the country, parts of South Wales, for example, um, Cheddar area in Somerset. They're not something we really have in London or have been really looked at. We do have areas of formerly historically quite polluted soils, but there's never really been done any research on the plant responses. Oh, I see. How much of a problem is Himalayan balsam in London? Um, right, Himalayan balsam is, in a terrestrial context, is probably one of the most severe invasive species. It is most problematic, it's fair to say, in the cooler north and west because it's a Himalayan submontane species. But it is locally on rivers in the London area quite severe. Um, it is also a really good example of the foolhardiness of repeatedly introducing species. So we've, I've been working with the biocontrol people on developing, or they've done the developing, I'm doing the advising of a rust species, it's a fungus, that will manage and suppress the populations of Himalayan balsam in this country, which will make Himalayan balsam management a lot easier in the future, hopefully. It won't eradicate it, it'll just suppress the population. That work has been made considerably harder by the fact that genetic studies have shown that populations of Himalayan balsam in this country have originated from three or four different source locations in the Himalayas. And unfortunately, two or three of those source locations, the populations of Himalayan balsam are barely affected by this fungal control mechanism, which means we've now got to go and find more ways of controlling this because the populations are just going to respond. So this is one of the reasons why, you know, actually just releasing stuff into the natural world when you think it's already there is really dangerous because if you put more genetic diversity in the landscape, the organism has got more capacity to adapt. It's one of the reasons I argue that whilst Japanese knotweed is an important and negative impact as an invasive species, it's not our most serious problem because most Japanese knotweed in this country is a single female clone, it's a single individual with virtually no capacity to reproduce sexually and therefore adapt. Budlier, on the other hand, which is a species we all tend to ignore as a society, has multiple introductions of multiple lineages. It is sexually adaptive. It is reproducing at an enormous rate and is adapting into our environment with potentially, well, increasingly catastrophic consequences, which we're ignoring. So introductions can, if you do them time and time again, can make the problem worse. At the moment, the only realistic way of controlling Himalayan balsam is by starting at the top of a river catchment and working down and pulling, 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 and then coming back the next year and pulling, pulling, pulling. And if you miss a plot of land because the owner won't let you or a patch you couldn't get to, your problem's that bare again. So at the moment, we don't have any really good tools for dealing with Himalayan balsam. Oh, is, is loss of brownfield sites? Yes. Um, brownfield sites in the London area and the Thames Gateway have some of our, particularly for invertebrates, some of our most important and species rich habitats in urban areas. Um, and they are or were some of the most exciting habitats I've ever been on in southern England. Um, when I was surveying for the Greater London Authority at the beginning of the 2000s, I went to a site which was an incredibly diverse and complicated matrix of bare soil, which is really good for things like but a hymenoptera and ground boy bearing insects, many, many different sort of plant communities. I never counted so many plant species in an urban habitat in my whole life. Um, it has now got um, several buildings on top of it. So yes, brownfield sites are a classic example of how urban biodiversity at its best is overlooked. Um, and tragically, you know, we're still losing them in the London area. Okay, any more questions we have? Because we are getting close to, I think, our wrap up time. Unless anybody else has something that they would like. Can I just ask one very quick question before? Sure. You mentioned Budlia. And 
So, I mean, I always think of Budlia as this, you know, mm. bee friendly, insect friendly mm. plant. And you are now dissing no. it. What's the. Uh, well, it's, it's interesting how over. I've been dissing Budlia for 25 years. And I used to get screamed at in the London area about this. Um, increasingly, bit by bit, more and more people are agreeing with me. So, for example, Bud Life and Max Shardlow have come out and saying, you know, that Bud Lear is not a good idea. Unfortunately, I think, again, this is a classic example where a conservation sector took a, a nice idea and it went through several prisms and has come out into a bad place for us, a bit like wildflower seed mixes. So as I say, seed mixes can be useful engagement tools, you know, in say school spaces or certain park spaces for getting people connected with nature. The idea of Budlia being good for, for butterflies and nature largely sprung from that kind of thing. If you've got a Budlia in your garden, you can attract lots of butterflies and it's really nice. That thing of being a lovely thing in your garden and very nice for butterflies has segued into this awful belief that Budlia is a good and important part of urban biodiversity and is not. The evidence for Budlia being good for invertebrates is essentially none. So I have been researching information on Budlia and what it actually really, really supports. And there are very, very few invertebrates that really use it and to any extent, um, aside from uh, visits for nectaring. And in that, there's some actually some worrying things as well. So Budlia outside of, you know, the common widespread things which do use it on one side are, um, does not support virtually nothing because the foliage and the wood and the roots and everything else is essentially unpalatable to most things. So there's like two hoverfly species and one moth or two moths that occasionally feed off the foliage and the wood, etc. So Budlia does have a value as a nectar source. But one of the things about Budlia that is really interesting and worrying is that Budlia is what's called a, um, a pollinator captor. It's got a very, very successful strategy for out-competing other plants about pollinating insects. And there's a series of studies done on this um, about 20, no, it must be nearly 20 years ago now, where some researchers got some common European butterfly species, so browns, a, a tortoiseshell and some whites. They, re they reared the butterflies, they let the young adults hatch and they let them then feed on either Budlia, yarrow, knapweed, and a couple of other common European plant species. The butterflies that had Budlia first, before being given other choices, preferentially went back to Budlia over the other plants. So in essence, what it's doing is out-competing other plant species for nectar, for pollinators, by being more attractive on one level to those insects. For so there's some potentially really negative impacts where you've got very, very high budlier abundance for pollinator success and well-being for plants and their reproduction. The other thing about budlier is, you know, it is massively competitive. Many urban sites are now being swamped by budlier um, and the previously species rich, diverse habitat with other plants, other natives and non-natives are losing ground. I would say it's pretty fair to say if we could get the mapping done, Budlia now occupies far more landscape and environment than Japanese knotweed ever did over much of Great Britain. So a lot of our responses have been, again, aesthetic. We like Budlia because it's pretty and purple and it allegedly is good for butterflies. We don't like Japanese knotweed because it has fluffy white flowers and the only things that go near those are beetles and who gives a hoot about beetles. So again, our emotional responses are triggering what we think is important as opposed to the evidence that's in front of us. And another thing is also about real biases, both within this conservation sector and across the population as a whole against urban biodiversity. 
So when Budlier was seen as just urban, you know, just the plant of, you know, central London and railway tracks, nobody gave a hoot. Nobody was interested. We are now seeing Budlier start to colonise chalk grasslands, coastal cliff habitats, sand dune systems, open grassland habitats, and also I'm finding in ancient hedgerows and starting to appear in ancient woodlands. This has all happened in less than a hundred years because Budlier was first found in the wild in Wales in 1921 in Merionethshire and then in London in 1927 in Usley in West London. So in less than a hundred years, it has gone from being a rare horticultural thing to becoming one of the most widespread shrubs of lowland Britain. That should terrify us. Uh, but it doesn't because we, we, our aesthetic blinkers are on. In the case of Budlier, actually, it itself is probably going to be outcompeted by Tree of Heaven because Tree of Heaven kills Budlier. So, yeah, no, Budlier is not our friend. Well, <laughs> um, well, given that we have no more questions and we are getting close to nine o'clock, I think we could wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Mark, for making us think think carefully about how we approach some of the things that we need to think about when we when looking at how we can uh, deal with the urban environment and being very careful about auditing about thinking considering those 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 steps that you suggest are I think it's it is more. really really important you know we're all scared this is really terrifying time for us as individuals and for our societies and the people who are younger than us. But this is the probably the worst time possible to make stupid mistakes. We really need to think before we take action. Mm 